Hello everyone and welcome to this presentation. I am Elena Sukaku, the author of the Inclusive Classroom Profile. I have with me today Michelle from Wisconsin and Amy from Rhode Island. Both Michelle and Amy are ICP trainers. Today we will discuss inclusive practices for each and every child. We will focus on 12 areas of inclusive practice that can be assessed using the ICP assessment measure and ways to support their application in early childhood classrooms. In the first part of our session, we will share information on the ICP assessment tool and 12 practices. Next, you will have an opportunity to take a closer look at one of the ICP practices and what it looks like when used in a classroom. In the third part of our session, we will present a professional, a professional learning program developed for one state to support implementation of the ICP practices through coaching. The Inclusive Classroom Profile is a structured classroom observation measure designed to assess a set of evidence-based inclusive classroom practices in early childhood programs. Ratings on the ICP items indicate the extent to which classroom practices intentionally adapt a classroom's environment, activities, and instructional strategies to encourage children's active participation in the group through adjustments that might differ from child to child. The ICP is organized around 12 areas of practice or items that have the strongest research base for supporting the developmental and learning needs of each and every child included in the classroom. It uses a one to seven point rating scale to define quality within each of the 12 practices. Ratings range from one involving practices considered highly inadequate for promoting children's engagement in the group and meeting their individual needs to a rating of seven indicating practices that promote the highest degree of children's active participation, including individualized strategies and accommodations. The ICP tool is designed to complement existing program quality assessment measures and standards by focusing on everyday inclusive practices at the classroom level. So what makes the ICP practices inclusive? In the ICP, inclusive are practices that first of all consider each and every child. They are the evidence-based practices that, that on one hand scaffold and support the individualized learning needs of every child, while at the same time encourage active participation of all children in the group. We often perceive these two ideas as mutually exclusive, but in high quality early childhood classrooms, we need both. Solely focusing on children's participation without embedding strategies that support children's individualized learning needs neglects the diverse learning profiles of our youngest learners. Likewise, recommended specialized interventions can still be implemented in non-inclusive ways if they consistently neglect opportunities for children to be actively engaged in the classroom's activities and interactions. So in the ICP, high quality inclusive practice for all children lies in the marriage of these two ideas. Now let's take a look at how the ICP is designed to be used. The ICP can be used in several different ways. As a research tool, it can be used to measure and compare quality across various types of early childhood programs. It can be used to assess the effectiveness of specific professional development interventions, often as part of a pre and post design where the ICP can be applied to measure the quality of classroom practice prior or after the implementation of an intervention program that is being tested. The ICP can also be used in research to examine the relationship between classroom quality and children's developmental progress when linked to various children's outcomes or goals. As a classroom and program quality assessment tool, the ICP can be used to assess inclusive practices in a program to meet standards and establish best practices. In this way, it can also help identify model classrooms. The ICP can also be used to inform professional development. As a quality improvement tool, the ICP can be used to get a baseline, to see what practices are being used, how children are being supported, to be able to build quality. For example, it can be used by consultants or program administrators, supporting teachers to inform classroom plans of action 
and goal setting as part of a professional development coaching program for teachers. Furthermore, the ICP can be used by early childhood teachers and various specialist professionals as a self-assessment tool to increase reflective practices. It can also be part of a credential or certificate within quality rating and improvement systems as an additional quality endorsement or specialty area. And finally, the ICP can be used as a shared resource of recommended practices to encourage and support collaboration between general and special education professionals. So what type of practices do the ICP items assess? The ICP items assess environmental adaptations to support children's access and participation in daily activities and routines. It also looks at instructional strategies supporting individualized learning and engagement in activities and routines, procedures for monitoring children's learning and progress, as well as procedures for engaging with families and other professionals. A quick note here to add that most practices are observed when children are indoors or outdoors, during free play time, group times, as well as during routine care events. Ideally, an observation will span across a range of contexts. A unique aspect of the ICP measure is that quality is defined across several dimensions. These dimensions assess if and how well the practices are being implemented. It's important to remember that the ICP is not a checklist. Different indicators focus on the dimensions that are important for rating and scoring, such as, for example, if a practice was implemented or not. Some indicators look at how often a particular practice was implemented. For example, did children have many opportunities during the day to experience positive feedback about their efforts and learning? Another important dimension is consistency. Was the practice used consistently across learning contexts or across adults who were interacting with the children? Many indicators also assess where, where a practice was embedded and look at different contexts of learning. And finally, ICP indicators assess the extent to which practices are used to support each and every child included in the classroom. Now let me describe the structure of the ICP. We will clarify what the various elements of the measure tell us. Let's break down the different parts of the ICP to help us understand the structure of the measure. Understanding what the different components offer is helpful when using the measure well, and also in sharing information with teachers or other observers. So first, there are 12 items. The items represent the 12 areas of practice assessed by the ICP. The structure of each item is the same. As you can see, this item's name is transitions between activities. The next important component are the indicators. For each item, there are many indicators under columns 1, 3, 5, and 7. The indicators describe specific strategies that are being assessed within a particular area of practice. There are also a number of examples found in many of the indicators. These show ideas of what those strategies might look like when used in the classroom. And the last important component, many of the indicators have specific criteria for observing and rating indicators. When conducting an ICP assessment, we gather information and base our ratings on three sources of evidence, primarily through classroom observation of daily routines, activities, and practices, that take place indoors and outdoors for groups of children ages two to five. A short interview with a teacher following the observation and also documentation review. Here you can take a look at the 12 items or areas of inclusive practice on the ICP. The 12 ICP practices and related strategies have been based on the strongest available research on inclusive early childhood classroom practice. The ICP practices are also well aligned to the DEC recommended practices. Okay, let's take a closer look at one of the ICP practices. We're going to look at adult involvement in peer interactions. Amy, over to you. Okay, 
Thanks, Elena. We're going to take a closer look at item two, adult involvement and peer interaction. This practice area, adult involvement and peer interactions, aims at supporting peer interactions and nurturing the development of relationships and friendships for each and every child. This item on the ICP looks at how adults set up the classroom with areas, toys, props, and materials to create opportunities for children to interact with peers, whether adults intentionally initiate social activities and games during the day, and the extent to which adults use scaffolding strategies to support children in initiating and sustaining social interactions and friendships with their peers. To illustrate some of the strategies that adults can use to support children's peer interactions, we're going to watch a video of a teacher working with two children during a transition time as they're going as they're transitioning into snack time. After the video, we're going to have a discussion about the strategies the teacher used to support peer interaction between the children. As we're watching the video, we would like you to consider the following two questions. What are the strategies the teacher uses to support peer, inter peer interaction? In addition, think about how do the strategies benefit everyone in the classroom? This video shows a preschool teacher in a classroom encouraging a typically developing girl to sing and model hand movements for a boy with multiple disabilities. Can you show him how to wash his hands? Run your hands together. 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 Run your hands did you see the teacher using to support peer interaction? Well, Amy, I saw a few strategies. I think I noticed modeling when she claps her hand and the move with the movements of the song. She also used some verbal prompting when she was encouraging the little girl to help the boy um, be on his own. She also used proximity. Um, she was in the game. She was close to the children at all times to facilitate their interactions really setting up that environment to facilitate those those social interactions between the children. So now let's think about this a little bit more deeply. The teachers also using intentional strategies. We saw in the video that the teacher's sitting behind the peer and she's intentionally enlisting support from the little girl. So let's talk about how this strategy benefited both children. How did it help the boy? Well, I think this helps the boy in two ways. We know from research that children learn best from their peers. Learning different skills from a peer can be fun, motivating, and highly effective and a highly effective supportive practice. The teacher also builds more opportunities for peer interaction throughout the day. She's intentionally creating opportunities for both children to learn how to successfully interact with one another which will make it more likely to happen again later in the day or the next day. I totally agree, Elena. We can't assume that children know how to interact. We need to help them learn how to interact with one another. In this example, the teacher intentionally helps the girl to interact with the little boy. She can let him do the actions and so that they are able to have a fun interaction. The teacher uses strategies that also benefit the learning and development of the little girl. 
the girl may be interested in the little boy and not know how to interact with him. By intentionally facilitating the interactions, the teacher helps the girl learn that she can have a fun time with the boy by singing songs with him and that she can also follow his lead in the play. How does this help the teacher? This helps the teacher to create an environment of acceptance, belonging, which also connects to membership. Ultimately, by facilitating opportunities for spontaneous sustained interactions, she's helping the children to learn how to interact so that they will be able to interact on their own. The children will learn how to play together so she doesn't always have to be there. If we want children to be if we want children to independently interact, then we need to take time to teach them how to develop those skills. It's like winter. If we want children to independently put on their boots, then we have to intentionally teach them how to put on their boots. This teacher is intentionally teaching children how they can relate to each other by focusing on facilitating the interactions. As she goes on, she will not need to be there. She will in turn have more time to focus on the development of other skills. Right. Teachers need to intentionally facilitate children's interactions to develop peer relationships. When we teach children to notice their differences positively and understand each other's ways and needs, we nurture friendships. Guys, now that we have seen how these strategies benefit, benefit each and every child, let's take a look at how these strategies align to the ICP indicators. If you look at the item page on the slide, you will see two highlighted indicators that connect to the practices that we just saw in the video. Take a look at indicator 3.3. Adults initiate social activities and games during the day. Clearly, we could see that this teacher was initiating social activities during this transition time. She did this by bringing the two children together so that they could sing a song together. So now let's take a look at one of the higher level indicators. Take a look at indicator 5.1. Adults actively support peer interactions using specific scaffolding strategies, such as modeling and prompting, environmental arrangements and peer supports. In the video example, we saw the teacher enlisting peer support by having the girls sing a song with the boy. The teacher embedded modeling when she provided hand over hand assistant to the little girl and prompting when she encouraged the little girl to let the boy do it. In addition to setting up the game, as identified in 3.3, the teacher held the little girl's hands and guided her to use the hand movements. This taught the little girl how to interact with the little boy and have a successful experience. Having this successful experience will make it more likely for the two children to interact at another time during the day. Michelle is now going to share with us how we supported the implementation of practices with a small group in Pennsylvania. Talked about the uses of the ICP, the design of the tool, and the 12 practices. So now let's take a few minutes to talk about developing professional learning around the ICP and its practices. Two years ago, state child care leaders in Pennsylvania reached out to Elena and Brooks Publishing to request a tailored professional learning program for their state that was focused on the ICP. The group did have some previous experience with the ICP as three of their state assessors had participated in the ICP reliability program. The five-day reliability program had two parts. First, they attended an overview session, which really provided basic information how, on how to conduct an ICP assessment. The overview session was followed by four classroom observations in pre-K settings with an ICP certified trainer and an assessment of reliability proficiency. So after the, the Pennsylvania assessors became reliable on the ICP, they began to use it in childcare settings and they found the ICP to be extremely useful and they wanted to provide teachers with additional learning opportunities to continue the use of the ICP in Pennsylvania. So this led to the development of a professional learning program with the main goal of expanding the training and technical assistance 
on the ICP so that they could support early childhood teachers to effectively implement the 12 practices and create a high quality inclusive preschool setting for children with disabilities to learn and grow and develop alongside their peers. Today, I'm gonna to talk about the components of that professional learning plan and some of the lessons that we learned along the way. Okay. In the development of the professional learning program, there were four principles of adult learning that were really at the heart of the training and technical assistance. We ensured that all of the content was framed around the evidence-based practices of the ICP. All trainings included active adult learning strategies that were embedded throughout so it would increase the engagement of our participants. We intentionally created a safe environment for the professionals to have conversations and really engage in problem solving with their peers. And finally, we wanted the participants to engage in self-reflection and action planning to keep the work moving forward. So let's take a look at the various components of Pennsylvania's professional learning plan. It began with a state ICP training for early childhood providers. This included early childhood teachers, which included both regular and special education teachers and early childhood quality coaches. The training was held across the state in various cities. The main focus of the full day training was really on raising the awareness of the ICP. The training also promoted the implementation of the 12 practices and what they would look like in action in a high quality inclusive environment. In addition to the training, the Pennsylvania team supplied participants with numerous materials and resources that all aligned and did promote the 12 practices. We all know training alone does not change practice. So a coaching component was a must in the plan. There were 25 quality coaches who were trained on embedding the ICP practices into coaching to support early childhood teachers implementing the practices in their classroom. In addition, we discussed coaching techniques that would increase the likelihood that teachers could use those practices. The coaches had two full day trainings that really went deep into the practices as well as to provide support and coaching on all of those 12 practices. A rather unique component of the program was the use of guided observations to see the ICP practices in action. Six of the 25 quality coaches then participated in three days of guided observations with ICP certified trainers. The observations allowed the participants to take their new knowledge of the ICP and apply it in real life classrooms, settings and situations. The trainers and the participants debriefed each day after the observation, as well as they talked about how they might use the information from that observation to provide support to the teachers and the program. We believe this really was a key component of professional learning because it allowed for rich discussions about how the observation actually connected with the indicators of the ICP. The final component of the program was the development of a community of practices for all of the coaches. The program included monthly virtual community of practice meetings over two years and scheduled face-to-face -face events. The purpose of the community of practice was to provide coaches a way to share coaching tips, to discuss best practices, and to ask questions of their colleagues, and most of all, just to provide support to each other. The training team really did reflect on each and every step of the program, and they made adjustments as needed to meet the individual needs of the participants. Participant feedback was collected regularly and used in all future planning. We would like to share some of the data that has been captured so far, as well as a few of the lessons that we've learned along the way. Let's take a look at the data first. Ongoing participant feedback is needed and must be used to make adjustments to meet everybody's needs. From the feedback, we clearly saw that the guided observation training was highly effective in supporting the coaches to understand the application of the practices, and the participants reported feeling more confident about the ICP after the guided observations. The varied formats of the professional learning program were intentionally designed to promote collaborative problem solving. Components such as the community of practice were intentionally designed to encourage professional networks in Pennsylvania 
with relation to the coaches to continue to work together, which hopefully will result in a more sustainable system. Hi, everyone. We want to thank you for taking the time to spend with us this afternoon and learn about the ICP. For additional information, please contact my colleague, Carolyn Burke from Brooks on Location or myself. Amy, Michelle and I are going to spend the last few minutes live now answering any questions you have. 